Chapter 51 Hinmei and Ishan spun around. In the arched entranceway, a figure robed in silver-gray was kneeling and speaking to the muscle. No, your parents didn't miss you, he was saying to the muscle. They're still in their winter sleep, right in their muscle shells, like all the other swallows. Yes, when everyone wakes up in the spring, I'll tell them you aren't making it up, it was not just a dream. The man looked up and saw the children. He smiled. It was a broad grin, almost as if he had just told them a secret joke. It was so open and warm that Pin May smiled back. Hello, he said, standing up. As he did, Pin May saw that he leaned heavily on a coral cane and one of his pant legs hung empty. The hand that clutched the cane had a long, deep scar that went up his arm under his sleeve. His face also had a long scar across it, but his eyes sparkled with such merriment that it was barely noticeable. He rushed over to them eagerly. Ah, you've come, he said, grasping their hands with the affection of a long-lost friend. The Sea King has been quite impatient for you, especially after yesterday. He thought you were being abominably slow, but of course, time is so different up there. A long time for us is a short time for you, or is it the other way around? I think it goes back and forth, like waves of the sea, you know. Do we know you? Hin Mei asked. The man's disarming manner was so forthcoming she couldn't help wondering if he had mistaken them for others. Maybe, the man said, laughing. It was such a joyful noise that it seemed to tickle. Hin Mei and Ishan couldn't help laughing too, though Pin Mei wasn't sure what was so funny. I've been called many names up there. Stone fish, happy fish, not a dragon, special treasure, gift. Of course, my favorite one was joy to the heart. Such a nice girl gave it to me. What was her name? Maisie? May? No, it was Maya. Joy to the heart? Hinmei repeated, feeling her thoughts beginning to swim. I know it's a bit of a mouthful, but, the man started. I do know you. Hinmei interrupted. You're in the stories. You are the fish that was given to the first king of the city of bright moonlight. Ah. Uh, I am remembered, the man said, pleased. It's been a while since I've been up top. I was sure I'd be forgotten by now. Fame is so fleeting, you know. But, you're not a fish anymore? Hinmei asked. You're a man now. Oh, he said. We only take on these forms in honor of the Sea King. He used to be a mortal man, so he's most comfortable like that. So since he's most often in human form, all who live at sea bottom do the same while we're here. Hinmei scarcely heard him. If you were the stonefish, she said, still thinking hard, that means you were also the statue for the magistrate that broke. Yes, joy to the heart said, making a face and lifting his cane. That's when I lost part of my tail and cracked my fin. Not a big deal when I'm in fish form, but it's a bit inconvenient here at sea bottom. Couldn't you just be half fish or something? Ishan asked. You could just have a fish tail. Oh no. Joy to the heart said, looking shocked. I would never dream of that. For me to have a fish tail in this form would be an insult to the fish tail goddess, Nuwa. The only one who is allowed to take on a form like that is the princess. Why? Ishan asked. Because she was born that way, Joy to the heart said with pride. It was a great blessing to his majesty. His child born in Nuwa's likeness. That was an occasion, I can tell you. It's because the Sea King swallowed the red stone, Pinmei said, her thoughts now leaping and diving. The red stone was Nuwa's last drop of blood. Some of Nuwa's blood must be in the princess, which is why she has a fish tail. Joy to the heart wasn't listening. Instead, he was leaning against the terrace railing. What a celebration that was, he said, lost in the memory. They painted the whole sky with colored water. A picture would form and melt away into another. And what pictures? Pictures of the king shaping the tear into a pearl, of Nuwa fixing the sky, he said stretching out his arm. And, of course, of the princess. 
His smile waned slightly as he placed his hand on the railing. Poor princess, he said softly. I hope she's doing well. Why? Ishan asked. Why wouldn't she be? She left some time ago. When was it? Joy to the heart said. The last time I saw her was when I gave her that needle from the treasury. What's that? What? Hinmei and Ishan said in unison, looking around. Joy to the heart raised his cane and pointed at Bema. There's a new Longma, he said with excitement, and then with even more excitement said, Why, it's Bema. He finally got his immortal form. You know him? Hinmei asked, surprised. Well, I knew him as a stone, Joy to the heart said. He was like me a stone that dreams of becoming something else. Here at sea bottom, we can look almost any way we want, but to actually become something else forever, we need the help of someone up there. Why? Hinmei asked. Why? Joy to the heart looked puzzled, as if he had never thought about it before. I don't know. Mortals are the only ones who can give immortality. It has always been that way. What do you mean? Hinmei asked. His words made her thoughts twist and snarl, as if they were a tangle of seaweed. Joy to the heart looked even more perplexed, his smile transforming into a frown. Well, I guess it's because it's the mortals who create the memories that last, he said, scratching his head. Without those, immortals forget. They can even forget who they are. Right? He looked at Ishan, who only shrugged back at him. There's a lot of stuff I don't remember, but I know who I am, Ishan said. He grinned. How about you, Hinmei? She made a face at him while joy to the heart frowned again in confusion. Finally, he shook his head. Anyway, how do you know Bema? Actually, Ishan said, we wrote him here. Did you now? Joy to the heart said, his smile returning. Well, why not? Shall we go? Where, said Pinmei. To see the Sea King, of course. Isn't that why you are here? Joy to the heart said, laughing, come along. I'm sure he's waiting. Chapter 52 Hinmei and Ishan followed Joy to the heart through the crystal-paved entranceway and the courtyard to the palace's great hall. At the doorway, two guards stood. The guards were so similar in appearance Pinmei had to check and make sure one was not just a reflection. Both of them had beady eyes and long, thin whiskers that sprouted from their noses and chins. Hello, my laughing fellows. Joy to the heart said cheerfully. The two guards did not smile back. Some guests to see his majesty. They're from up there. Joy to the heart pointed his cane upward, narrowly missing one of the guards' feather. Helmets. Hey. Watch it, the guard said. After making sure his helmet was straight, he asked, It's been tense around here since yesterday's visitor. Is one of these the one he called for? Must be, joy to the heart said, winking at the children. They rode in on a longma. They are kind of small, the other guard said. Aren't they usually bigger? Come, now, joy to the heart said in answer. You of all creatures should know how little size matters. Hinmei caught Ishan's grin. They're really shrimp, he mouthed to her. Good point, the other guard said, and he pushed open the door. Come along. When they entered, Hinmei felt as if they had stepped inside a pearl. Everything was illuminated with a soft white light. Beautiful women and men glided around the room, their flowing robes waving a dance of color as they moved. Visitors from above, the guard hollered. All went silent and Pinmei knew what a fish in a bowl felt like, for hundreds of large eyes stared at her. She flinched, but one pair of eyes fixed a gaze so piercing upon her that she could not look away. They were, of course, the eyes of the Sea King. A thin silver mist emanated from him, and his beard fell like a cascading waterfall. The deep ridge of his forehead was finished with two branched dragon horns, one on each side of his head and the broad nostrils of his nose flared. As he stood, his robes shimmered, the purple shifting until it was the same deep blue of his jasper scepter. Come, he roared. 
the shrimp guard, pushed them forward. Hinmei stumbled, pulling Ishan with her so they both ended up in the humblest of kowtows. The king sat back slowly in his water-jade throne, his eyes still fastened on them as his jaw stiffened with displeasure. He motioned for them to rise, allowing Ishan to fix his hat before addressing him. Your children, the sea king, said, the frown on his face darkening. You cannot be. I am Ishan. He motioned to Pinmei. And this is the storyteller's granddaughter. Pinmei, she said, lifting her head. Her voice thinned in the air as she flushed. I'm Pinmei. Yes, Ishan said, a smile teasing his mouth. Pinmei is the storyteller's granddaughter. His shoulders lifted and his face straightened. What did you call for? Hinmei sneaked a glance at Ishan. He was staring intently at the Sea King, who was looking back at him, the brow above his blank eyes creased in a cavernous fold. Perhaps Ishan thought it best just to act as if he understood what the Sea King was talking about. Hinmei pressed her lips together. Finally, the Sea King snorted. He lifted his fingers at the guard. Bring yesterday's visitor, he ordered. As the guard clattered away, the Sea King turned to them. I called about the winter, the king said. The upper waters are starting to freeze. We know, Ishan said. When I realized even my royal powers could only unfreeze the water for a moment, the king continued, raising an eyebrow, I knew I had to alert those above, which is why I lit the beacons. The Sea King stopped and looked at them dubiously. Yes. Ishan said, and Pinmei was surprised at his tone of impatience. The breath of the black tortoise is overpowering everything, the king said. He has been here too long. It is not for us to dictate his stay, Ishan said. He has his mandate. Pinmei felt her mouth falling open as she stared at Ishan. He could not just be pretending. Ishan seemed to be standing taller, his face unusually serious and authoritative. What had happened to him? And what was he talking about? I know, the Sea King said, annoyed. But this is different. The Black Tortoise is in trouble. The Black Tortoise is invincible, Ishan scoffed. What could harm him? I don't know, the Sea King said. But he needs help. The Black Tortoise needs help? Ishan said, and it was his voice that was full of doubt this time. How do you know that? As if in response, there was a clatter of the guard returning. Here, the guard bellowed. The group of watching nobles, their robes swaying, parted to make a path. All were silent, and Pinmei squinted, for she could not see what person they were shifting for. But then she saw. It was not a person at all. Instead, slithering toward them like a twisting piece of black string, was a snake. Chapter 53 Come, the Sea King said to the snake, waving his hand. Tell these children what you told me. The black snake slunk forward, and Pinmei saw it slide through the air, only an inch or so above the floor. The snake turned and looked at them with tiny eyes like knotted black threads. The black tortoise needs help, hissed the snake, its voice like the wind through pine needles. What kind of help? Ishan asked. What has happened to him? The snake turned back to the Sea King, stretching its neck as if pleading. The black tortoise needs help, it hissed again. Yes, but, Ishan began. It says nothing else, the Sea King interrupted. The snake moved to coil itself next to the Sea King's throne. I do not think it can. But you see, do you not? The black tortoise is in trouble. Ishan nodded. Pinmei raised her eyebrows at him to try to get his attention, but he continued to look directly at the Sea King. You are right when you said nothing could harm the black tortoise, the Sea King said. But something must be keeping him from leaving. I know little of your world these days, but I do know it is in your world that the tortoise is trapped. You, the Sea King hesitated, obviously skeptical, or someone up there must free him. Ishan nodded and Pinmei finally felt she could not let him continue. What was he doing? Why was Ishan talking to the Sea King about the Black Tortoise and Winter? 
were they even going to ask about the stone? With a surreptitious glance at the king, she jabbed Ishan sharply with her elbow. He yelped and looked guiltily at her glare. Actually, we're here for another reason too, Pinmei said, hoping her voice did not squeak as much as it did in her ears. We'd like to ask about a luminous stone that lights the night. A luminous stone that lights the night, the sea king said in surprise. It has been a long time since I have heard Nuas Tear called that. Nuas Tear? Hinmei said, frowning. Yes, the sea king said. When Nuwa, the great goddess with the fish tail, sacrificed herself to save the sky, the earth, and the seas, she left behind three things. Do you remember what they are, storyteller's granddaughter? Hinmei looked up at the sea king, but his eyes were as unreadable as black waves of water. She nodded. Her husband pulled out a strand of hair as Nuwa transformed, Pinmei said. The iron rod, the sea king said. When he pulled the hair, there was a drop of blood, Pinmei continued. The red stone, the king said, and he touched his chest. But, before that, Pinmei said slowly, Nuwa shed a single tear in sorrow. A luminous stone that lights the night, the sea king finished. He drew himself up proudly. I am honored to have all three of these items in my dominion. Why you do? Hinmei stuttered. You have the luminous stone? A stone rests in my kingdom, the sea king said. At least, partly. Can we see it? Hinmei asked. All her irritation and confusion disappeared in her eagerness. The luminous stone was here. They were so close. Please. That is easy enough, the sea king said, and without warning he stood up. All the attendants and nobles sprang up in a flurry, rippling out like waves in the water. Come, he said. Let us go see the luminous stone that lights the night. Chapter 54 The sea king waved away his servants and attendants with a flick of his hand and motioned for the children to follow. The black snake silently uncoiled itself and slithered alongside. Ishan, Hinmei whispered fiercely, pulling him to fall behind the king's billowing robes. What was that about? What? Ishan said with pretended innocence. Hinmei glared. It worked out, didn't it, he said. We're going to see the stone right now. She looked at him with narrowed eyes as he grinned at her. Hey, Ishan called as the sea king led them out of the palace. Aren't we going to the treasury? The sea king turned and looked at Ishan with his eyebrow raised, the disbelieving look returning to his face. To see Nuwa's tear, the sea king said, We must go to the garden. Do you not know that? Oh, um, yes, Ishan said quickly. He reddened as if truly embarrassed. I just forgot. Hmm, the sea king said, his nostrils flaring. He continued to walk, the garden is this way. It was not like any garden Pinmei had ever seen before, not even in her dreams. Again, jellyfish lanterns lit their way, making the crystal stones of the mosaic pathway sparkle. There were flowers of unimaginable colors, their closed blossoms like polished shells. Heavy with glossy pink and white fruits, the coral tree branches swayed softly above her. No, not fruits, Pinmei realized, shaking her head. Pearls. They reached a bridge and, with a hiss, the snake slithered away. Almost soundlessly, it splashed into the water and vanished. Hinmei could not even see a faint shadow of it as they began to walk over the lake, or was it an ocean? The bridge stretched and stretched only to disappear, and Hinmei could not even imagine where it ended. Are we walking over the sea? Hinmei asked faintly. This is the heavenly lake, the sea king told her. The immortals of the sky call it the Celestial River, and you mortals call it the Starry River, but here we call it the Heavenly Lake. I suppose to us at sea bottom, it seems more the size of a lake than a river. But the Starry River is the sky, Pinmei said, shaking her head in confusion. It's up. Hi. This is below. The Sea King nodded. Our worlds connect here, he said. The bottom of the Heavenly Lake. Is your sky. 
Hinmake could only stare. The water below them was as smooth as a jade plate and melted into the horizon. It was as if she were walking through an infinite night sky, and it was making her dizzy. After another long pause, the Sea King stopped and brought them to the edge of the bridge. Here it is, he said, and waved his hands toward the water below. A soft glow shone from the reflections on the lake, bathing them all in light. Nuas tear, he said with reverence, or a luminous stone that lights the night. Or, Hinmei thought as she stared downward, the moon. Chapter 55 Both Ishan and Hinmei gazed down at the moon. It was a perfect, glowing circle in the still black water, and the reflection of the thousands of fish above twinkled around it exactly like stars. Hinmei felt as if she were looking down at the night sky. It's beautiful, is it not, the Sea King said. A luminous stone that lights the night, the Sea King finished, motioning downward. I myself found it long, long ago. I shaped it into a dragon's pearl, but it was never meant to belong to one being. It belongs to everyone in the sea, sky, and earth. That is why it floats in the heavenly lake, so all can see it. Of course, Ishan whispered, almost angrily. I am such a fool. Why didn't I remember? I should have realized. How would you? Hinmei said. Who would have thought the moon would be at the bottom of the sea? The pure light stroked her face with the tenderness of a mother, and she felt a wave of anguish. The moon. They were here to take it to the emperor. But how could they? Why did you wish to see it? the Sea King asked. We need to take it, Ishan said. To give to the Emperor. What gave the Sea King said, and began to laugh, a deep, roaring laugh. His head arched back and his hand thumped against his chest in amusement. You. Take Nuas Ter? That is the most ridiculous thing I have ever heard. It's not ridiculous. Ishan flashed, his face the color of his hat. A little goldfish like you? The Sea King laughed again. You are a fool. You could not even lift it from the lake, much less carry it from the sea. I can. Ishan was shouting like a spoiled child, and he moved as if to climb over the railing to dive into the water. Ishan. Hinmei hissed, grabbing him. Stop it. What is wrong with you? He's laughing at me. Ishan huffed. He called me a fool. Well, if you dive into that lake to try to get the moon, you are. Hinmei said. The lake is the sky. You could be falling forever. Ishan grabbed Pinmei's wrists to push her away, but his fingers caught on her string bracelet. Suddenly, he stopped struggling. You're right, he said. The resentment disappeared from his face and was replaced by a mischievous expression that puzzled Pinmei even more than his anger. Anyway, I don't need to jump into the lake, he said. He gave the Sea King a smug look. I can get the moon another way. Chapter 56 Why you can? Pinmei stuttered, confused. Ishan grinned, and Pinmei felt hope bubble inside her. Maybe he could and if he could, they could still save Amma. Just let me borrow back that bracelet, Ishan said to her. She gave Ishan a baffled look, but rolled the string off her wrist and handed it to him. He gently tugged at the knot until one end of the string was pulled out, forming a small lasso. There, he said, and began to move to the edge of the bridge. Ishan, you're just teasing. Hinmei groaned. You know that's much too small. It'll never reach the water, and it won't fit around the moon either. You'll see, Ishan said, giving her braid a tug. He bent over the bridge rail and dangled the lasso from his hand. Together, the Sea King and Pinmei leaned over to watch. They both gasped in disbelief. The small circle continued to lower, going down, down toward the water, and the string in Ishan's hand stretched longer and longer. Noiselessly, the ring slid into the lake. Was the water magnifying it, or was the loop getting bigger? When it finally wavered next to the moon, it looked as if it were the moon's empty outline. Hinmei stole a glance at Ishan. 
had he somehow gained a magic power? But Ishan still looked like the same boy, tilted dangerously over the bridge's railing, now with the tip of his tongue sticking out from the corner of his mouth. Almost there, he whispered. He flicked his wrist and the string circle swayed, missing the moon entirely. Ishan grumbled, twitched his wrist, and missed again. He did this over and over again until... Ha! Huh. Ishan said. Finally, on his sixth try, the loop neatly encircled the shining moon. Ishan grunted with satisfaction and began to pull, the noose tightening around the moon until the delicate thread looked like a thin scratch of blood. Slowly, carefully, Ishan began to lift the moon. It grew larger and larger until the great globe seemed to be filling the lake. And as it came closer, its glow became stronger and brighter, with a brilliance so dazzling Pinmei could scarcely bear to look at it. The light was whiter than snow, whiter than ice, whiter than the purest flower or pearl. The black waters and sky turned to shimmering silver, and Pinmei felt as if she could drink its radiance. You are thieves. A choked noise broke the spell of their awe. Pinmei and Ishan looked away from the moon to see the sea king, and both froze. His mouth was gaping and his arms were reaching out helplessly toward the luminous water. But it was his eyes that made them stop. Those eyes, which had been so unreadable before, were now illuminated with the light of the moon, and they were filled with horror and revulsion. You would steal, the king continued, his words strangled noises. It does not belong to you, not to only one. How, how could you? Ishan saw the disgusted eyes of the young boy that the Sea King had been, the great hero who had refused to hurt anyone, even to save himself. Hinmei saw the eyes of Amma, dismayed and disappointed. Suddenly, they were both ashamed. Hinmei and Ishan looked at each other, stricken. Put it back, Pinmei ordered. Put the moon back. We can't trade Amma for the moon. We, the Emperor, have no right to take it. Ishan nodded. He lowered the string, and the glorious brightness began to dim. The enormous ball got smaller and smaller until, finally, it was only a glowing circle on the black silk of the night. Ishan shook his wrist to remove the string, and all watched as the released moon returned to its place in the limitless heavenly lake. Ishan breathed a sigh of relief. I don't think the emperor's going to get his luminous stone he said. Chapter 57 Hinmei smiled feebly at Ishan, but when their eyes met, she knew they were both aghast at what they had almost done. Ishan looked over at the Sea King. Even now, the Sea King was leaning motionlessly over the bridge, the glow of the moon on his still-concerned face. Don't worry. We're not going to take it, Ishan called out. The Sea King raised his head to look at him. We were just, uh, Joking, Ishan finished lamely. To Pinmei's surprise, the Sea King turned to them and bowed to Ishan. I apologize. I should not have doubted you, he said with a respect one gives to an equal. I should have. Realized that even while young, you could still. It's nothing, Ishan said, cutting him off. His face flushed again, this time from shame. Pinmei's hands were trembling and she felt her knees quake. Weakly, she sat down, her back against the carved stone wall of the bridge. Her hand rubbed her wrist, naked without Amma's bracelet or even the red string. Ishan, waving away any further words from the Sea King, sat next to her. I got carried away, Ishan admitted in a low tone. But the moon isn't something the Emperor should have. We can't take it. Amma wouldn't want us to anyway. Pinmei said. Just thinking of Amma cut into her chest, but she knew her words were true. Amma would never want them to take the moon out of the sky. She would be horrified by the thought. But without the luminous stone, without the moon, would she ever see Amma again? The blackness of the sea suddenly overwhelmed her, it was nothing more than a vast emptiness. Pinmei's eyes stung with tears. You're right, Ishan said after a long moment. He handed her the damp string bracelet, returned to its original size. We'll find another way to get Amma back. Hinmei nodded and rolled the bracelet onto her wrist, 
not meeting his eyes. Despite Ishan's assured tone, she knew it was a hollow hope. There was no other way. What else could they do? Tears continued to fill her eyes, and she reached into her sleeve for her handkerchief. But, as Pin May brought it to her face, she realized she was holding the paper of answers. She stared at it, and shafts of light from the full moon below streamed in through carved openings behind her. If there is another way to get Amma, Hinmei said, waving the clutched paper at Ishan, this is how we can find out. Chapter 58 What? Ishan said, startled and confused. The paper will answer any question in the light of the full moon, Hinmei said, waving the paper toward the dark water. The moon is full here. And any immortal can read the paper, the emperor said so, remember? An immortal? Ishan asked. Hinmei cocked her head over at the sea king. You mean, ask him to read it for us? Ishan said. Hinmei rolled her eyes. Yes, she said. The paper can tell us if there is another way to get Amma. Ishan took the paper from Hinmei, his hands caressing it in an almost loving gesture. Then he stood. Your Majesty, he said as Pinmei scrambled to her feet, we have a favor to ask you. The Sea King stepped forward. Ah, just a paper now, he asked. Not a book anymore? Pinmei's words rushed out in her eagerness. It's the paper of answers, she said. If we ask it a question, can you read us the answer? Yes, the Sea King said, but he had a puzzled look on his face. But surely. Thank you, Ishan said in a voice that made both Pinmei and the Sea King quiet. Ishan stepped closer to the edge of the bridge, holding the paper in front of him as if offering it to the sky. Pinmei tingled with such excitement that she felt she could have been one of the flickering fish above. They could still save Amma. The paper knew everything. Ishan was already speaking. In a loud voice, each word like a stone dropping into water, he asked his question. How has the emperor captured the black tortoise of winter? Ishan said. Chapter 59 Hinmei shrieked a sound of disbelief. Ishan, she hissed. What about Amma? You were supposed to ask about Amma. Ishan said nothing and just looked at her sheepishly, holding the paper away from her as she flew at him. Dark marks were already forming on the page. Why did you ask about the tortoise? Hinmei said, unable to stop. How will we ever get Amma now? Her last words ripped out of her in a wail, plaintive and piercing. But the cry, so raw in her throat, disappeared in the blackness like a single tear falling into the sea. Hinmei, Ishan said in a wheedling tone, will get her back. How? Hinmei said accusingly. The emperor wants Amma for her stories, right? Ishan said. You know all the stories too. We can figure it out ourselves. Figure it out ourselves, she said, glaring. We wouldn't have to if you hadn't asked the paper about, about, the tortoise. Listen, Ishan said, coaxing her, I had to ask about the tortoise. We need to save Amma from the emperor, right? Well, how do you think he suddenly became so powerful? He's captured the tortoise. That's why it's still winter and the emperor is invincible. If one could make the black tortoise do anything, that person would be invincible, Amma had said. Could Ishan be right? If the emperor had the black tortoise of winter, he was invincible, and they knew the emperor had taken Amma because he wanted to be immortal. Did the emperor plan on being invincible forever? Hinmei looked at Ishan, and his eyes gazed into hers with a rare earnestness. It's not just Amma who needs to be rescued, Ishan said, and suddenly Pinmei thought of Lady Meng and the slave workers of the vast wall, the hollow eyes of the king of the city of bright moonlight, the tear-stained faces of the village children, and Suya's emptying rice jar. Pinmei closed her eyes. The emperor. The tortoise. The winter. Amma. Was it somehow all sewn together? And was the black tortoise the stitch that needed to be pulled first, before it could all unravel? Hinmei opened her eyes, but she still saw Amma's face in her mind. 
Her chest felt as if the weight of the moon pressed against it, but she slowly nodded. You're right, she said, the words dry in her mouth. Ishan smiled gratefully. He turned to the Sea King, who had been watching them in uncomfortable silence. Please, Your Majesty, Ishan said, handing the Sea King the paper, could you read this? The king took the paper with an uneasy look on his face, and he gave Ishan a questioning glance. But he held the paper over his head. His eyes widened. What does it say? Ishan asked. How has the emperor captured the tortoise? It says, the sea king said as he lowered the paper, the look of shock still on his face, with the iron rod. Chapter 60 That makes sense, Ishan muttered, more to himself than to the others. What else could hold the black tortoise? It's the only thing. The iron rod. The iron rod? Hinmei asked, the king's confused look now on her own face as well. Isn't that... Nuwa's hair? Isn't that here? Instead of answering, the sea king opened his mouth, and a roar, like the rushing of waves, sounded. Before the call could even echo, two figures appeared. They were obviously royal guards or generals, for their heavy copper-colored armor almost completely encased. Them, with only tufts of fur peeking out. As they bowed low, it was easy to imagine them as transformed crabs. Go to the treasury, the king said, and see if the iron rod is there. The two guards bowed again and, with a flash, disappeared. The sea king turned back to the children. If the iron rod has been stolen, it must be found immediately, he said to them gravely. It is much too powerful to be misused, as I fear it has been already. The emperor must have gotten it, Ishan said. I do not understand how, the sea king said. We do not heavily guard it, for only an immortal could take it from sea bottom. Your emperor must have gotten an immortal to steal it for him. Or he just got lucky, Ishan said darkly. The emperor has a bit of an obsession with immortality. Hinmei looked at Ishan, a hundred questions silently filling her open mouth. He looked like the same boy she had always known, but he was acting as if he were as powerful as the sea king. But before she could force out a word, a clicking sounded behind them. The two crab guards had returned. The iron rod is not in the treasury, your majesty, one of the guards said. You checked carefully, the sea king asked. You know the iron rod can shrink to the size of a needle. The guards nodded. Begin a search for it at once, then, the sea king said. Question all the servants and check all who have ever been to the treasury. Make sure to ask the queen and her handmaids, sometimes they use it for their sewing and other fine work. If the iron rod is in the sea, I want it found. The guards bobbed and bowed, and with more clicking, they disappeared again. The sea king looked once more at the children. But I think we know the iron rod is unlikely to be found in the sea, he said to them. So it looks as if the task of retrieving it will be up to you, my small friends. We'll go immediately, Ishan said. Do you not wish to rest after your travels? The Sea King said courteously. It would honor me to host. That's not necessary, Ishan interrupted. We've been away long enough, and with time being different down here and everything, who knows what has happened up there? Very true, the Sea King said. He bowed respectfully and said, I will take you to the surface. You will take us? Hinmei coughed. As if in reply, the Sea King straightened to let out another roar, this one long and thunderous. His robes billowed out in colossal waves, flowing past Pinmei and Ishan. The silk settled onto a massive, powerful shape and transformed into iridescent scales. When Pinmei finally dared to look back at the Sea King, she saw his head had elongated, with deep brows shadowing his glittering eyes and his horns now majestic. The Sea King had changed into a dragon. Come, he said, his voice sounding as if it were coming from the depths of the sea. Ishan quickly clambered onto the dragon's back and held out his hand to Pinmei. Hurry up. Pinmei stared. The dragon's scales shimmered and glistened, he was a gigantic mountain of luminous colors and light. As she hesitated, 
The dragon turned his head toward her, his impenetrable black eyes piercing her. Come, storyteller's granddaughter, he said. You will be needed too. Hinmei nodded and, without taking Ishan's hand, climbed onto the dragon's back.